Welcome to webinar three. This is a re-recording of the content delivered in webinar three of three of our uh, NEC 2017 code changes. This webinar will focus on chapters five through eight and new articles, and uh, it will be hosted here by Mel Amundsen. We are recording. Take it away, Mel. Hi, guys. How's everyone today? Welcome you to our webinar, and we're going to get a chance to take and look at the major code changes in 5 and 8, plus a couple of new articles that appear out here. Give you a little bit of background who I am. My name is Mel Amundsen. I'm one of the subject matter experts with NTT on the National Electric Code. Uh, I've been in the industry now for over 40 years doing uh, electrical work, originally out of the utility business, and even owned my own contracting company for a number of years. So, you know, it's uh, a lot of background in there, a lot of code, a lot of code. I remember my first code book was a little bitty book, and now they've really grown a lot. So we're going to take a look now and just kind of jump out into these. Uh, a little bit about what has been going on here in, you know, our webinars. Uh, we have done uh, three actual webinars. This will be our third one. There should all be available uh, through our uh, NTT site out here. So I believe also on Facebook they're going to be available. So this is chapter the or no, number three of the group. A little bit about the blocks of code and what's actually how their availability at this time. Uh, the PDF version is already out. So that guy is available. You can download it now. It came out uh, uh, mid uh, uh, middle of the month here. Soon the softbound version and then the loosely bound version of the actual books will be available. And those of you who like to use the handbook, you're going to have to wait till November for these guys to come out. So uh, it's been voted on. Uh, the National Electric Council actually, the uh, National Electric Code Councils actually voted for it on August 4th and officially it becomes effective the 24th of August, of August here. So let's go take a couple look at a couple of our new articles now. Uh, these are the five major new articles within the code and we've got 425, article 425 is our fixed resistance and electrodes out here, 691, large-scale photovoltaic electric supply stations, uh, 706, energy storage systems, 710, standalone systems, and 712, direct current microgrids. It's interesting to look at, really, 691 through 712. All of those are new energy systems that we're beginning to look at and how our systems on a pretty much across the United States we're looking at the changes, what's coming in. You see the photovoltaic, standalone systems where your people are using energy sources to completely operate their facility as a standalone from the utility. So we're going to expand on these articles here just a little bit more. Let me take you out here. Here's four. This is 425. This is boilers, industrial boilers, fixed resistant. So these are the big guys that are uh, the boilers themselves, electrode boilers, stuck to your strip heaters. Um, what or where this came from is that the actual technical uh, complexity of these high-level boilers, these larger boilers, actually went beyond what was in the original codes. And so they created the Article 425 to handle these fixed industrial uh, process heat you know, process heating equipment out here. So, you know, it's growing. We're using more and more of them. Here's 691. 691 is my large-scale photovoltaic uh, electrical supply stations out here. Is the official title for it. We are seeing large electrical big grids set out here, uh, big panel displays, and so on. Uh, living in Florida, I see a lot of these in the utilities are building these as well. We're talking now minimum generating capacity of no less than 5,000 kW. So they are very large scale. They are not all exclusively, though, operated by utilities. There are large industries that are putting these out as well. A couple of things on this. Uh, they must be operated by qualified personnel. 
out there and you'll see your standards for out there, your electrical safety standards that go in that. The access has to be controlled into these uh, as well. So those standard warnings, all the different labels, everything have to be on our signage and everything, fences and, and guard gates and things like that. So, and we're talking about these being controlled through medium to high voltage switch gear uh, out there. And, uh, and then controls out, you know, as they go into other interconnect with other systems. So, so large scale. Uh, they're large enough. One of those, one of the cited points within the article is also they shall not be installed on buildings. Like I said, new new equipment out here. Uh, it's got to be approved, listed, labeled, field labeled where applicable, and so on. So uh, you've got, like I said. New new area out here that's coming on 691. 706 storage systems. This is how are we going to store the energy? You know, we're pulling it off solar systems, we're pulling it off wind systems, any number of other systems. How are we doing it? They're I they are addressing the actual storage itself. What is capable of stuff of out here? It does it's not limited to anything in but you know. Any type in particular, it can be batteries, capacitors, your kinetic devices such as flywheels, compressed air, can be water storage. So, so it's uh, a, you know it's the energy of the future out there. How they're storing it, how they're dealing with it. this is uh, one of the beginning ones out here that looks more and more. Than, and it's to try and make sure that it the safety. Requirements are met out here. And the minute you're going to see in 710, this is a system here that sits alone. This is a you know article that covers equipment out here that you know get your own standalone power system, whether it be a, a photovoltaic, whether it be wind power, where actually other type of generated uh, fossil fuel or so on out here. This is trying to make sure that it is done safely. Okay, so we've actually got the safety requirements out here for these systems. Similar safety systems were laid out in Article 690. Now they moved them out to 710. Standalone power systems and power, you know, control systems out there listed and labeled. We've all been through that time and time again. So. Uh, we look at this in, in terms of how are they wiring, multi-wire, multi-wire brand circuits, standalone out there as well. So let's talk about microgrids now. Another article out here. So micro, my microgrid out here is, I'm, let me back up one. I got standalone microgrids out here, sorry. Power distribution in these systems. How We've looked at standalone. We've looked at energy storage. Now we've got microgrids. This is a entirely DC system. We're seeing dedicated DC systems for backup power. We're seeing it for computer systems, LED lighting, variable speed motors, and so on, where they can take and have a direct utilization of DC. Okay, so. This is a DC complete grid that can be you know be used out here uh, without going through a conversion from an AC to a DC or DC to an AC. We gain a great deal of efficiency, and so there is a emphasis to move into this direction. So the telecom and the data industry has really picked up on some of these. So. Data industry or data centers out there are beginning to seriously look at this. So, within this, you got to seven uh, seven twelve dot four. You're going to see labeling and listing at it. How to identify the uh, circuit conductors in dot twenty five out there. Different available voltages dot thirty DC sources disconnections dot thirty four and so on. So they're taking it and building it and making a safe system for us to work with. So arc fault protection, by the way, is in there too. We all see that. In all of our different areas. So, uh, let's see. We're going to go out to let's take a look at some of the highlights now in actual changes within the articles. It's all the new articles. Let's go out and take a look at what's going on in these guys here. So, here, first thing off, some articles where we've lost some material. Article 500, 
all of the different hazardous terms and all 14 definitions moved from 500 and were moved then out into Article 100 at the beginning of it. So you're going to find deleted sections out of 500.2 you know, is gone. 501, 502, 503, all of these, you're going to see definitions are gone out of these. What they, in all, they've moved 14 definitions out to 100. So definitions are there. You just gonna have to go out instead of being right there in the hazardous location uh, articles. You're gonna find them now back in 100. So, like I said, definitely uh, uh, some moves with that. So we, you know, uh, it's just it's interesting. I know I've always used the articles there and found it pretty easy to get around within that and hazardous, but now. Part of this is meeting the NEC actual standard for writing codes. So I think that's a, that's a lot to do with it. So what else is out here? 101.10. Uh, we're seeing, we have for years in our hazardous locations, and this is a class one, which is gases and, and vapors. Division two temporary exposure. Well, we've always had to use class one division one full time exposure. Had always been RMC and, and IMC threaded couplings. What they're allowing for us to do now in division two, which is a temporary exposure to gases or ignitable materials out here, we're seeing they are allowing a, a slip type fitting that is rated, oftentimes they're called compression fittings on these. So I now have this available. This is another uh, new device in here for RMC and IMC uh, out here, but only in Division two locations. These are a compression type fitting. So new, let's say new one out here, so new parts of that. Uh, other things in here in commercial garages. Well, what they've done is they've looked at NFPA 30 and they which deals with garages and so on, commercial garages repair, and taking a look at how, how am I going to make it safe out there. You know, what am, kind of work am I doing? I'm now dealing with gases that are heavier than air such as your LP gases and so on. And then I've got lighter than air gases, so they're trying to address some of these changes. And so what you're seeing is new standards in terms of piping and, and what can be done there. So my, a little bit, on, as I said, on lighter than air gases and so on on that. Uh, also, you're now allowed to use PVC uh, in these things. Let's take a look at this guy right here. Let's see. Give me a boom. Oh, went too far. Uh, 511 underground wiring uh, in our commercial garages repair. Uh, my new one out here lets me use PVC, uh, RTRC, and HDPE where buried under not less than two feet of cover in a commercial garage. So, uh, like I said, different ones out there. This uh, it comes out, talks about terminations in in 511 uh, and so on and how we can we can use these guys out here. So next one out there, 517 and healthcare. 517 is one of, Article 517 is one of the largest articles in the NEC, the code there. So there's a tremendous, there's lots of changes out here, things that uh, we've actually added, things that have moved, things that have been taken away. So uh, we took a look at this one right here, a little bit on healthcare, what, uh, and uh, a major change in the use of the grounding of isolated ground receptacles out here. And they've defined uh, for us inside a patient care vicinity and outside. So what are they what they're saying is inside a patient care vicinity, isolated grounding receptacles shall not be installed in those. And then we've gone to be here outside of isolated grounding receptacles uh, used are installed in patient care areas 
shall then comply with 517.16 and 60B1 and B2 uh, on these guys out here. So seeing some changes, look at it. It depends on if you're into the, you know, what you're using out here. One of the problems that has been, uh, you know, they're trying to address a little bit more is that does everybody actually know exactly how they're all putting together the general rules? These are the rules right here. 517.16 talks about the use of isolated ground. There was some research done at, at hospitals, and people were not always clear exactly when they were using the grounding cable, when they were using the grounding structure, such as your conduits and so on and also an isolated ground out here. So what they're doing is trying to provide you with more information out here, give you better protection, and making sure one of the things they've looked at is the use of requiring a yellow stripe for the insulated ground out there. So it modified that a little bit, but it hasn't definitely come out and said, okay, you got to use the yellow stripe with it for the isolated ground out there, but it is to be a separate circuit, and that was a problem that they found in research. People were not keeping them separate. They were tying the standard ground cable, and then a, a, a separate, separate isolated ground cable, which is supposed to be continuous all the way back to the main grounding panel. That's a dedicated circuit. Well, they were tying them together. And so they're trying to address some of those issues, and that's what you're saying. It's not so much as new as it is clarification with these guys in terms of grounding and so on. So Article 555, marinas, boatyards, commercial and non-commercial docking, ground fault protection. Problem has been in our marinas is ground fault protection and protective systems as a whole have been a little bit hit and miss and oftentimes a patch work of different kinds of code. Do they use a marine code? Do they use a national electric code? This is coming out and saying you are going to use a national electric code. You are going to pre create a ground fault out here to keep people from getting electrocuted. And I read every summer uh, in my trade magazines where people have gotten in, you know, gotten water around boats, ships, things like that, and got killed because they've gotten shot. People have miswired equipment, and without a GFCI furnishing power to the, these boats and boat yards and, and houseboats and so on, it you can end up with current in the water. So what there's the saying right here is ground fault protection. They are to have a ground fault protection. You can use the 30 milliamp GFCIs on here to be consistent with uh, what they've had for assessment in marinas and everything. So there are actual pedestals. You can see in here we've got a picture of a pedestal out here. So ready, you just basically bolt it onto the dock. And so and run your cable and your power out there obviously correctly but ground fault protection out there. A couple other things also pop up though with the marinas. Uh, signage, permanent signs must be installed, give notice of shocks. I said, you know, we're, you know, we're having people getting hurt, we're having people getting killed. Uh, one really uh, nasty ones that I saw, we had several children killed near a, uh, a boat dock and marina up in, uh, I believe it's in Kentucky uh, a year or so ago. So they just jumped in the water and got electrocuted. So some wiring had been done backwards. So, hey, signage out there, warnings, you know, potential shock hazard, electric currents may be present in the water. So very important, put it out there. So once again, though, obviously the new 30 milliamp GFCI protection is going to help a lot too. Anybody slip or fall or get into the water that way as well. So uh, let's see, temporary installation GFCI. This is kind of an interesting, because this is a, a, a specialized GFCI, and that's exactly what it's called, Special Purpose Ground Fault Circuit Interrupter Protection for Personnel. Uh, this is a class of GFCIs that can be used 
primarily industrial environments, uh, commercial, commercial construction, where they've got motorized equipment where our standard Class A GFCI at 46 milliamps trip point is insufficient to handle some of the motorized equipment that they're using. In particular, paint mixers, drills, and so on. What you're allowed to do now in the special purpose GFCIs is put a class of GFCIs in there that operate at 10 to 15 milliamps. Okay, it is uh, allowed out there. It's got to be a mark that, yes, this is what it is. Uh, it's not something you're going to put in your home nor allowed to do. So, but the new standard there in UL 903, the GFCI uh, UL codes is what you're seeing right here now. So, you can see right there, uh, our signage right there. There's our good old Class A's. Got them all over your house. C, D, and E, those are my special ones, in particular Class E out there. So, new GFCIs for temporary installations. Signage out here. Article 600, marking of equipment. As we're seeing equipment move from fluorescent to LED, uh, the insides may be changing and people may not realize. So. As I'm coming in and retrofitting a illumination system like that, it is to be marked that it has been changed out there. The kit, you know, who provided uh, the uh, kit itself, where you've taken, you know, fluorescent, now you've got the tubular uh, LEDs in there, got to require a label on there to help us uh, deal or understand what the hazards are out there because there are. Where before we had a ballast in there, we have some different systems and so on in there. So uh, labeling, there is some labeling with this out there. Whole idea, let them know that yes, it's been changed up. Also, how about these guys? Also in 600, your signs to your side, photovoltaic signs, all field wired components, some so it's off grid, standalone, or on grid, non grid interactive. Uh, PV installation shall be installed with accordance. Well, we're back to 690. What this does is say, okay, I got a sign out here now. That's you know, and how is it you know how is it running out there? So I got some standard UL48. Then pick up on this and say that yes, you're going to label this guy out here. So let us know you know what kind of disconnects and so on are with this. So the whole idea is self-contained standalone sides. What are they operating at? What are the voltages. So they may have different voltages. They may be the class 2 voltages and so on with that. So uh, like I said, new self-contained standalone equipment out here. So you may run it, come out here and run across something runs everything runs at 30 volts DC or less and so on. And then they have different requirements say for grounding and so on. I also need to look at am I running other equipment with this such as uh, inverters, motors, uh, you know, different other types of DC equipment out here. You know, let every, you know, let them know uh, what is going on out here with uh, with signage and so on with these guys. Understand the voltaic and everything with the cable and what they've got to meet and so on. So let's see. Let's take a look at another uh, new article. And this kind of jumps in still the same thing, signs and so on. Uh, so, so I was mention, mentioning things as I am operating this equipment. New blocks of code out here. You know, they are to be listed. You know, for standard equipment, wiring systems out here, wiring of the components should be out here. You know, uh, obviously routed as close to the side and the body of the enclosure out here. So flexible cords and cables. Your Article 400 out here. They are to be rated for outdoor use and so on when you're using around with this photovoltaic sign. So they're just giving you some overall new requirements, and they're really not new, but addressing, yes, because of this device, this photovoltaic sign, these are areas that we have to meet. As you can see, though, there's grounding, there's disconnect means, battery compartments, and so on with these that are all parts of that. So information technology equipment, uh, 645. Surge protection, critical operation data, to give you a system that is reliable. So these are allowing you to put in uh, surge protection 
on this. And if it is a critical operation, it may be a requirement, especially critical operations for systems such as uh, public or public safety, uh, emergency management, uh, and so on, like that uh, security and all this. So definitely critical operations data systems. We got to look at how we protect those as well. Surge protection, industrial machinery, 670.6. So if it has safety interlocks, it shall have surge protection. What happened with this is that what they found is that machines that had safety interlock systems, the surges had damaged them. Was the safety interlock still working correctly? And was there a failure point in it now? So what happened from a data assessment of these types of devices is that they're saying, hey, we now want a surge protection system to help protect it out there. So got to be in place, protect your workers from the interaction with this machinery. So uh, let's see, 680 swimming pools, pools, fountains, and similar installations out here. Uh, this is for the electric powered pool list. We ended up with a complete new part eight in article 680. What's a pool lift? These are put in here, these are electric pool lifts that can provide service to uh, pools or spas for people having disabilities. Uh, it's They've been out here for a while. The problem is there was no real code. So what this is doing is is bringing them in compliance with the NEC regulations. You know we have out here and some things that you and I take for granted around both equipment bonding. How should they be bonded and so on? So places and and I see them in travel in my travels uh, in public pool areas and so on. And these electric powered pool lifts. So. Need to make sure they stay safe. So, new article out here from this guy. Uh, let's see what else. This is just more on a little bit more on my lifts, uh, protection on it, uh, being tied into my Eagle Potential grounding grid out here. Any switching devices, what they've got to meet, nameplates, and so on so that are out here with this. So, like I said, very convenient. Make sure they're put in with the, the latest, greatest NEC regulations to keep safe. Get the whole idea is keep her, you know, keep us safe. Out. 690 calculation of current for your photovoltaic systems. What they've done is said, okay, we're building these systems larger and larger. Do you know what the current is? And so we had all sorts of different ways that different manufacturers giving us to calculate current. What they have done is they're actually doing our standardized calculations, the sum of the parallel connected photovoltaic modules, their short circuit current, and multiplied by 125% is one of the methods of the maximum current. So, and if they have generate, they generate capacity greater than 100 kW, it, it has to be calculated by the manufacturer. It's it's not that we haven't looked at these before, it's, but now we want to define them better and make sure that the arrays are safe. They are generating what they do. And, you know, we end up with the correct current value. So our, our safety control equipment, our circuit breakers, our cabling, so on, all that are affected by this current need to be sized correctly out here. Emergency branch circuits, transfer switch. Uh, this is an interesting one. We've always used circuits out here like this for fire, uh, fire pumps and so on. This allows you to have a, an emergency lighting load, not more than 20 amps, okay, to provide individual circuits of emergency lighting in and on uh, sites that may need that. Okay, that have that. So it is ahead of the normal branch circuit. Okay, it's ahead of it. So it also could be listed as part of the branching transfer switch as well on this one. So it's a new, new one out here. Uh, one of the last major ones out here is that in Article 840, 
premises powered broadband communication systems, what they're looking at, and this is some of the code making panels that look at all of the uh, articles in, in chapter eight has said, okay, we need to be able to identify, bring in new cables. And so what they're talking about here is unlisted wires and cables as they're coming into the building. And what are the requirements that they need to you know, need to meet. So what the code making panel did is they created this and uh, they have defined uh, by optical fiber cables, by comm cables coming in, by coaxes coming in, and basically a proposal on how to recognize them and then address them in a safe manner so that we do put them in safely and correctly. So. All right, folks, that is pretty much our articles out here. Uh, we, you know, try to give you a good, uh, nice brush of all the uh, what's new in there. There's lots of changes going on. Uh, Randy and I both got a chance to attend the uh, conference, the NFPA conference, uh, back earlier in the year, and it was amazing uh, what goes on out there. To give you a little bit of idea of what we all, you know, we do here, we do have the National Electric Code courses. We will have change courses, and we have National Electric Code courses that we provide here at NTT. Uh, we're also got specialty courses. We do grounding and bonding uh, courses out here within this area. Hazardous location courses out here, and the code changes. So we're going to do a uh, create a one day. Uh, course it is an in-depth analysis of the code changes that can be brought in then with other codes. So we do that. We also provide all types of other programs out here. Uh, we have our hydraulics and pneumatics, our HVAC. Uh, we have several auditing programs, different things like that, which I'm sure our people would be more than happy to spend some time with you and talk with you uh, anytime. So fee please feel free Give us a call anytime you want. A couple of specials, or a special we have in particular is if you participate in our webinar here or listen to it, uh, picked it up off Facebook or anything, when you give us this discount code, we will give you $150 off any course that we're going to do through this year. So nice, nice uh, way to do it. So we're looking forward to everything to be uh, online here. Uh, the, it's going to be out here on Facebook and also, I believe, through our uh, NTT uh, system as well. So, hey, with Mel, that, just to jump in. Um, uh, as far as availability you... for the webinars, um, okay, we will be releasing these with email. Uh, it will be on social media, like like Mel said, and then uh, we'll have links on the website as well. So, through our blogs and, and various posts, uh, we'll be sharing this. Uh, as a part of our, our uh, 2017 NEC rollout. So it should be well available to, to all of our, our clients and users. <clears throat> all right, sir. Anything else? Everybody work safe out there, and we hope to hear from you. So, Brett, you can send us on our way here, I guess, now. All right. Well, that sounds good. Uh, thank you for watching. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to NTT directly um, on our website. There's a contact us page. You can email us directly at contact at nttinc.com and check out more of our videos. We appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mel.